This episode is brought to you by ADT. Mysteries are always fun to unravel, but not when it comes to your home security. Luckily, there's ADT. They now professionally install Google Nest products with their smart home security, which means plenty of smart devices to help you protect what matters most. Because ADT believes the smarter the home, the safer the security. To see how ADT can help make your home smarter and safer, visit ADT.com. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. This episode makes mention of suicide and heavy drug use. Please take care before listening. Clothing brand Von Dutch defined mid 2000s style, capping every celebrity they could with their signature trucker hats and motorcycle culture prints. But behind the low rise flaming eyeballs and perfect pinstripes, Disputes about ownership and management kept co-founder Bobby Vaughn on edge. In February of 2005, a homicide was linked to Bobby, sending Vaughn Dutch into a downward spiral and the victim's family on a quest for justice. This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I walk you through the murder of Mark Revis. This case takes us to Venice, California, a beach neighborhood with quirky history that played out about 14 miles west of Los Angeles. Venice was founded as its own municipality in 1905, but was incorporated into Los Angeles about 20 years later when it struggled to keep up with its own governing needs. The city was modeled after its namesake city in Europe, laced with canals that braced real estate developments against the naturally marshy California coast foundations. Intended as a beach resort with a number of tourist destinations designed to highlight its slice of the West Coast, Venice came to embody the mild climate and laid-back surfing culture of the area. Its pier and boardwalk are several miles long and famous for their artsy and family-friendly attractions and performers. The beach drew other types of crowds as well. In the 1950s, Venice became a hub of weightlifting and bodybuilding culture. In the 1960s, counterculture hippies moved in for the cheap rent and non-judgmental vibes. Venice became a haven for up-and-coming artists like The Doors, who formed in the area and stuck around as they became famous. Venice is also the birthplace of skateboarding, which started as sidewalk surfing, alongside the emergence of punk music. The eccentric city developed into a culture of its own right throughout the 1970s and 80s. In the early and mid-2000s, Venice began going through its own version of gentrification, as startup tech companies and their employees started spilling over into the city from Silicon Valley. As the area slowly restored its former glory, celebrities started migrating to Venice's beachside homes as a retreat from the madness of central L.A., They brought an extra layer of glamour and acceptance to Venice that helped the area rebuild its reputation. But the beachy town also had a dark side. Its conglomeration with Los Angeles had started as an afterthought, and the rest of the city never quite knew what to do with it. After oil was found there in the 1930s, Venice became flush with enough money to ride out the Great Depression. But soon, The drilling that sustained its residents polluted the areas tourists enjoyed most, and the canals became toxic eyesores. An initiative to clean up the area and rebuild parts of the historic pier helped the town regain some of its original reputation. But Venice still contended with its share of the growing number of gang wars and drug epidemics that ravaged Southern California through the late 20th century. During this time, Venice, like the rest of L.A., was grappling with change. The Los Angeles Times' homicide report claims 89 people have been murdered in Venice since the year 2000, and 29-year-old Mark Revis was one of them. On the night of February 4, 2005, 
a 911 call came in from an apartment located in the Venice Boulevard and Speedway area of Venice, California. It was Bobby Vaughn who told the dispatcher that he had just shot and killed his roommate, friend, and business partner, Mark Rivas. Bobby said he was defending himself against Mark during an altercation that turned physical. The police immediately arrested Bobby after a quick sweep of the crime scene, which showed them that Mark had been shot in the head and chest with a gun that Bobby admitted was his. He also admitted he had just used the gun on his friend. Bobby spoke in detail about his account of that night on the Hulu docuseries, The Curse of Von Dutch, A Brand to Die For. Bobby claims that on the night of February 4th, 2005, he and Mark went back to their shared apartment after they'd been drinking. Bobby passed out for a while and then woke up to feel this weird energy. He said he heard bickering between Mark and Bobby's then-girlfriend, Nicole. Bobby said the argument was about Mark trying to steal Nicole's diamond rings, a recurring conflict between the men. Bobby said he got in the middle while trying not to take sides. He claimed Nicole stormed out of the apartment to her car and drove away. Bobby said Mark then proceeded to beat him up with a broken tequila bottle. And when he stopped, Bobby claimed he locked himself in his bedroom and waited it out until Mark came to his senses. Instead of cooling off, however, Bobby said that Mark came back to him agitated, saying chalk it up, their term for murder, a reference to the chalk outline drawn around a murder victim's body. Bobby said that's when he retrieved the Glock that he kept on a bedside table as Mark kicked his way through the locked door. According to Bobby, he tried to reason with his friend and told him he didn't want to shoot him, he just wanted to get out. Apparently, Mark didn't stop, and Bobby then tried to push his way past Mark to get out of the apartment. When that didn't work, Bobby said he saw Mark going for the gun in his hand, so Bobby shot Mark in what he, and later his lawyer, said was self-defense. In the Hulu docuseries, Bobby said he thought about killing himself after realizing that he had just killed Mark, but something angelic told him not to. So instead, he reached for his cell phone and called 911. Because Bobby was the one who alerted authorities and immediately gave himself up as the perpetrator, law enforcement didn't conduct an extensive investigation of Mark Rivas' death. The incident seemed fairly straightforward, at least the way Bobby recalled it and related it in official records. However, someone claiming to be one of Mark Rivas' brothers disputes the details that Bobby gave, and as of the current day, continues to advocate for the justice he says Mark never got. An Instagram account attached to the name Joe Moreno posted a video on December 1, 2021, with a caption purported to be by this unnamed brother. The caption is a diatribe against Bobby Vaughn. The caption also says that he, Mark's alleged brother, was there in the apartment only a few hours after the murder, and that Bobby and the Hulu documentary makers both lied about how and why the shooting happened. The Instagram post states that Mark Rivas was not drunk that night and did not attack Bobby with a broken bottle, as he reported to the police and Hulu. The man claiming to be Mark's brother says that the bottle that was supposedly used was in the garage away from the crime scene when he saw it and that Bobby was the one who would get blackout drunk and violent, and that Bobby had downed an entire bottle of Jack Daniels that night. According to the Post, Mark didn't bother Bobby's girlfriend, and Mark only punched Bobby after Bobby had previously threatened him with a gun. None of this version of the story has been used in the official investigation, and this was the only video that Instagram account posted related to Mark's death. Since the anonymous brother says he was not a direct eyewitness to the incident itself, but only to the other circumstances of Bobby's behavior around Mark, we may never know the true details of the night Mark was killed. Murderish is sponsored by BetterHelp. 
Sometimes I just wish there was a handbook for all of life's challenges to tell me how to navigate problems when they come up. And getting different advice from my friends and family only makes things more confusing. I know it comes from a good place and they're only trying to help, but let's face it, they're not fully equipped to do so. Thankfully, this is where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp is online therapy with trained therapists ready to help you find the root causes of your problems and provide the tools and coping skills needed to navigate through them. And because BetterHelp is 100% online, this makes therapy the most accessible and convenient it's ever been. BetterHelp is the closest thing we have to a handbook for life, and better yet, it's completely catered to you. Personal sessions with my therapist have helped me work through issues, and this has replaced the heavy burdens I used to carry. With new feelings of self-empowerment, I feel more confident to tackle life's problems knowing that I'm better equipped and have better help on my side to help when times get tough. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash murderish. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash murderish. Being different is what makes us stand out in the world. And just as each of us are unique, so is our hair. It only makes sense that our hair care should be personalized to meet each of our different hair care needs. Function of Beauty is the world's first fully customizable hair care that creates individually filled shampoos, conditioners, styling, and treatment formulas based completely on you and your hair type. I'm not kidding when I say they literally offer over 54 trillion different possible formulas. And on top of that, each one is vegan and cruelty-free. With no sulfates or parabens, you can even go completely silicone-free. First, take their hair quiz to create your profile with up to five hair goals. And if your hair needs change with the seasons, maybe you suffer with dandruff in the winter and excess oil in the summer, don't worry because your formulations can be updated as often as you need to keep your hair on point. Next, you can choose your color and fragrance or choose to opt out and go dye and fragrance free. Personally, I like a little fragrance in my shampoo and conditioner, and I decided to go with a really pretty jade-colored bottle. After that, sit back and relax as Function of Beauty delivers your new hair products straight to your door, and prepare yourself for the good hair days ahead. Start giving your hair the personalized care it needs. Go to functionofbeauty.com murderish to take your hair goals quiz, and you'll save 20% on your first order when you subscribe. No commitments and you can cancel anytime. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash murderish to let them know you've heard about it from our show and to get 20% off your first order. That's functionofbeauty.com slash murderish to take your hair quiz and save 20% on your first order. Doesn't it feel like December goes straight from the 1st to the 25th with no days in between? No matter how early I start all of my holiday shopping and shipping, Somehow, I'm always running back and forth from the store to the post office at the last minute. And you know what that means. I have to stand in the absolute longest lines of the year. Being a mom and a business owner makes navigating the holiday chaos even more challenging. But thanks to Stamps.com, I can cut out those crazy trips to the post office and get access to the UPS and USPS services I need right from my computer. That means no holiday traffic, no lines, and no hassle. If you're a busybody yet procrastinator like me, it's not too late to get your holiday mailing and shipping under control with Stamps.com. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been a game-changing service for over a million businesses. I really don't know how any small business can keep up on shipping their orders during the holiday season without Stamps.com. This holiday season, trade late nights for silent nights and get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code MURDERISH for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. 
Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code MURDERISH. Mark Rivas was born in 1976 to Jorge and Carmen Rivas. His family descended from Aztec and Tarasco ancestors. As Mark got older, his family says he developed a deep appreciation of his Mesoamerican heritage. Mark grew up in Santa Cruz, a beach town in Northern California, about six hours north of LA. He was one of seven brothers. In his obituary in the Santa Cruz Sentinel, Mark's family spoke of a kind man with a loving, forgiving nature and a giant heart. They called Mark a great person who shared his feelings honestly, who devoted himself to his son, Marcus, who was three years old at the time of Mark's death. In the Curse of Von Dutch docuseries, Mark's brother Matthew described Mark as happy-go-lucky and loving, someone who was always glad to see his friends and family. According to his obituary, Mark also had an athletic streak and an appreciation of the outdoors. He played football and baseball at Santa Cruz High School, and like Bobby Vaughn, he'd been part of the local surfing culture, although Mark never got close to the semi-professional heights of Bobby's career. Although his obituary and family remembrances painted Mark as a gentle man, another piece in the Santa Cruz Sentinel revealed the violent side of his life. In the article, Santa Cruz police said that Mark had been involved in gang activities around the area as he grew up. They said he was part of a gang from the west side of the city, and in 1993, when Mark was 17, he was convicted of first-degree murder. Police say Mark shot a man in a fast food parking lot after asking who in the crowd was from an apartment complex that was home to the rivals of Mark's gang. Seven months later, when Mark turned himself in, his attorney said that he shot the man in self-defense after the man threatened him. Since Mark was just five weeks shy of his 18th birthday when the shooting happened, there was a question of whether he should be tried as an adult. Prosecutors pushed for the chance at an adult sentence of 25 years to life in prison, but the judge ultimately decided to place Mark in the California Youth Authority instead where he would be out by age 25 at the latest. Bobby Vaughn claims that he helped Mark escape the immediate aftermath of the homicide by smuggling him over the border into Mexico to hide out for months before Mark turned himself in. Mark's attorney said that his client had tried to keep himself out of the gang life, but that he faced pressure to stay in from many friends and even members of his own family. Mark also succumbed to pressure to retaliate against rival gangs for their crimes against his people, especially when another gang shot a member of Mark's gang. Mark's previous criminal record paled in comparison to his murder charge. He had a juvenile record for resisting arrest, but he'd completed the required six months of probation successfully and had long since moved on from that incident at the time of the parking lot homicide. After his time in California's juvenile justice system, Mark tried to stay out of the legal system. His parole officer vouched for his rehabilitation potential, but others said it would be too hard for Mark to get out of the gang life because his older brother was still deep into it. In 1994, the year after his own conviction, two of Mark's brothers were involved in separate shootings. His older brother, the one everybody warned him about, was convicted of shooting at two California Highway Patrol officers. He served 15 years for the crime. Mark's other brother was shot at at a Westside arcade. He survived the incident. Even Mark's father, Jorge Rivas, was caught up in gang rivalry. The 1994 Sentinel article said that Jorge was suspected of helping a gunman dodge police after participating in a Westside apartment complex shooting about a month earlier. All in all, it was extremely difficult for Mark to escape the cycle of violence when a number of his family members were so deeply entrenched in the gang life in Santa Cruz. Bobby Vaughn claimed he bought his first gun from the Rivas family connections. A childhood friend of Mark and Bobby's said, the Rivas family was about gangbanging. They were holding down the West Side. You always knew if something went down, they were going to be there, putting in the work. Though Mark didn't have to do adult-level hard time, 
Bobby said the time in juvenile detention hardened his friend by necessity. Bobby described the detention center as like gladiator school, where the inmates participated in caged fights that were like blood sport, the Jean-Claude Van Damme action movie about a secret martial arts group that fought to death. Bobby continued saying about Mark, he was already messed up and that just pulled him toward the final. By the time Bobby reconnected with his friend, he claimed that Mark was back into the gang life and stayed there until his death at the age of 29. Robert Bobby Vaughn was born on February 20, 1975 in Santa Cruz, California. According to Vaughn in The Curse of Vaughn Dutch, his birth mother was Japanese and his birth father was Mexican. They gave Bobby up for adoption and he was taken in by the White Vaughn family, where he didn't feel like he fit in because of his different heritage. He says he got teased a lot by other kids for being darker than his family, which caused a lot of identity angst. Bobby tried extreme measures to solve his identity issue, like taking over a dozen showers a day and scrubbing to make his skin lighter. Bobby said in the docuseries, in the beginning, it was like trying to play the role, trying to chameleon my way into the family. Although his adoptive family were nothing but welcoming, Bobby still felt the urge to find other people who were like him. He immersed himself in the famous local surfing culture early, hanging out with legends of the sport like Daryl Flea Verosco. By the time Bobby was a teenager, he was surfing competitively and getting sponsorship deals. According to a Huffington Post article written by another surfer in the crew, Verosco and the other core members went all out in their pursuit of surfing greatness. This included massive drug and alcohol addictions that almost killed them before several of the members sobered up. The group also embraced a fierce localism, a loyalty to Santa Cruz and its culture that expressed itself through enforcing an aggressive, uncrossable divide between those born and raised in the town and those who came over for school or the surf. Local surfers considered the water their turf, and defended it as such from those they considered posers. This mirrored the gang activity that Bobby would soon get into, trading the water for the streets. According to several articles, Bobby alleges that he was involved in a shooting while in high school and that he witnessed his best friend get murdered in a different incident. Although he declines to talk about it in the docuseries, Bobby readily admits he was deep in the gangster lifestyle as a teenager even when his family moved to Hawaii for a short time before he eventually landed back in California. Bobby said he and Mark Rivas met early on in high school. Mark impressed him during their first action together, a gang fight that broke out at a Taco Bell when they were together as freshmen. Bobby said Mark just laughed when he was stabbed by a screwdriver. He said Mark pulled the tool out of his leg and used it as a weapon against their rivals. Bobby said he also loved Mark's giant family, who he described as hard and thugged out. Bobby said Mark joked about the fact that Bobby had practically no family and that he had too many family members. The boys quickly became close. Bobby claims that Mark's murder charge at the age of 17 scared him into going straight while Mark was in detention. For a while, Bobby decided to concentrate solely on surfing. That's when he noticed the lack of surfwear that catered to his bad boy style. One day, Bobby saw a commercial for Bronze Age streetwear, and it clicked. Bobby was going to create his own streetwear brand. He started hanging around the offices of Bronze Age creator Mike Cassell. And in 1996, he and Cassell teamed up with Ed Boswell when they met him at a trade show selling Von Dutch patches. From there, the clothing brand that dominated the early and mid-2000s was born. The Von Dutch name came from the motorcycle detail artist Kenny Howard, who became famous for how he drew pinstripes on cars in the 1950s around the Compton area where he grew up. Kenny's signature nickname became the Von Dutch clothing brand logo when Mike Boswell bought the rights to his art from Kenny's daughters after his death. Bronze Age creator Mike Cassell became Bobby Vaughn's mentor as they both strived to get away from criminal lifestyles. Cassell was attempting to go legitimate after rumors that his previous clothing brand had been nothing but a money laundering front. In The Curse of Vaughn Dutch, 
Cassell admits to being a major drug runner and seller in Southern California. He even claimed connections with Pablo Escobar, the cocaine kingpin. Reportedly, Cassell brought Bobby Vaughn into Von Dutch after he and Boswell obtained the naming rights. However, some sources say Cassell and Bobby Vaughn were the ones who originally bought the rights. The true origin story of how Boswell, Cassell, and Vaughn came to do business together rely on oral contracts and conflicting claims from people who now hate each other, so we may never know the real story. What was abundantly clear was that their new business venture needed cash. The group initially got that from a woman they hired as a model for the trade shows they participated in. Eli Jane, a former gymnast and model, said that she and her mother were the first two investors in the Von Dutch clothing company. Not long after crossing paths with the Von Dutch owners and investing in their company, Eli began dating Bobby Vaughn. The couple fell for each other hard, and Eli became pregnant at the age of 18. She gave birth to her and Bobby's child, Elijah, while trying to recover from years of crystal meth abuse. Whatever the true order of ownership was, the Von Dutch brand needed even more money by 2000. They'd been upping their publicity and design costs until the company sunk into a $600,000 hole. By that time, Boswell had bailed on the company, and Cassell brought in a new financial backer named Tony Sorensen. Sorensen was a Danish award-winning martial artist who came to the U.S. in the 1980s to make it in Hollywood. However, after acting in a few B-movies and hating it, he looked for a different direction. Sorensen found his new direction in a Von Dutch shirt hanging on the wall of his favorite mechanic shop when he got into the area's custom car scene. Sorensen said in The Curse of Von Dutch, I thought Mike was the coolest guy, very lowbrow cool. Mike Cassell was thrilled that Sorensen found his way to Von Dutch. After all, he was married to a wealthy Brazilian and was willing to pour a lot of money into the brand to turn it around. Soon, Sorensen became the CEO of Von Dutch and began instituting more structure into their process to ensure returns on his investment. Once Sorensen got heavily involved in the company, Bobby began feeling sidelined. He thought he wasn't getting enough credit for the guerrilla marketing tactics he said he'd done on his own initiative and claimed his efforts are what made the brand so famous. Bobby said in the docuseries, everything was kind of going in a weird, almost non-communication level. He claimed that Cassell was busy sucking up to Sorensen in order to get money, while he, Bobby, was building the business through his own efforts to get Von Dutch clothing into the spotlight. Bobby was responsible for publicity stunts like getting Von Dutch clothing on Tommy Lee's MTV Cribs episode and handing out samples at strip clubs. Cassell later disputed Bobby's claims and said it was a group decision to go in that marketing direction. He also said that Bobby started to fade into the background at work during that time, around the year 2000. Whoever thought of it first, there was no mistaking that the Von Dutch brand skyrocketed in visibility and profit once it got into the hands of celebrities like Ashton Kutcher, Britney Spears, and Tommy Lee on red carpets and lifestyle shows like Cribs. Von Dutch representatives made that happen by sending free clothing and, of course, trucker hats to anyone who might make an appearance on MTV. They also made it a policy to let celebrities have anything they wanted for free at their flagship store in Los Angeles. Despite being a co-owner of a brand that made $33 million in profit at its peak in 2003, Bobby still felt left out. Soon, Bobby would find himself completely shut out of the company that he had helped to build. This year, you can prioritize what matters most when you share the gift of health from Everly Well. Choose from at-home lab tests like food sensitivity, women's health or men's health, or vitamins and supplements because love and health are all you need. Everly Well is digital healthcare designed for you with personalized results and accessible tools for long-term health. With over 30 at-home lab tests and high-quality vitamins and supplements, 
you'll be able to find the perfect test for you or your loved one. The Women's Health, Food Sensitivity, and Celiac Disease Screening Tests are only a few of the options. Here's how it works. Everly Well ships products straight to you or your loved one with everything needed in one package. If you ordered an at-home lab test, the sample can be simply collected at home and shipped back to a certified lab in the prepaid envelope included with the test. Digital physician-reviewed results are sent straight to your preferred device in just days. If you order vitamins and supplements, you can start adding them to your daily routine right away. I started implementing vitamin D supplements from Everlywell, and a recent doctor visit showed that my vitamin D levels were great, and I didn't even have to waste time going to the store and trying to figure out what I needed on my own. Everlywell makes it so simple, it's no wonder over a million people have trusted Everlywell to support their health and wellness goals, and now you can help your loved ones do the same. The gift of health has never been so easy to share than it is this holiday. For listeners of the show, Everly Well is offering a discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash murderish. That's everlywell.com slash murderish for 20% off your next at-home lab test. Everlywell.com slash murderish. One thing you don't want to do this holiday season is show up to any dinners or family gatherings empty-handed. But sometimes trying to find the right wine to bring as a gift can get a little stressful and expensive. So this year, let First Leaf do the hard work for you. First Leaf's experts will help curate the perfect award-winning wines for you and deliver them straight to your door. Give yourself the gift of saving time and money this holiday season. And hey, you can even keep a bottle of wine for yourself. To start, all you have to do is answer First Leaf's questions about your personal wine preferences so they can understand what you love and what you don't. With flexible and fast delivery options, not only will you be able to save your energy and do this all from the comfort of your home, but you'll also be able to save money, paying less than you would at the store. My First Leaf subscription has made my holiday shopping experience so much more affordable, fun, and easy because they select the finest bottles from around the world for me, so I'm able to impress everyone on my guest list with little to no effort but they don't need to know that. Sign up today and you'll get your first six bottles for $39.95 plus free shipping. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash murderish. That's T-R-Y-F-I-R-S-T-L-E-A-F dot com slash murderish to get your first six bottles for $39.95 plus free shipping. Tryfirstleaf.com slash murderish. According to Eli James, who was in a relationship with Bobby at the time, Bobby reunited with his old friend, Mark Revis, around the time he was feeling pushed out of the company. Mark had just completed his sentence for the gang murder when Bobby convinced Eli to take a road trip with him to Santa Cruz without telling her who they were going to visit. When Bobby started hanging out with Mark again, his girlfriend and business partners felt like he abandoned them for his old friend. Mark eventually moved to Venice and began living with Bobby. A few months after Mark's arrival, Eli made a controversial and difficult decision. She left her and Bobby's son with Mark because she believed she wasn't a fit parent after relapsing into heavy drug use. Bobby claimed that he and Mark began raising Elijah on their own, which also came with risks, according to Eli. She claimed that Bobby and Mark were getting back into the gang lifestyle around this time, which wasn't an ideal situation for young Elijah. Bobby claims it was at this point when he put Mark through a crash course on working within the Von Dutch company. After Mark saw the inner workings of the business, he supposedly asked Bobby why Mike Cassell was shorting them of what he saw as their fair share. Relationships between the business owners quickly collapsed after that point. In January of 2002, Von Dutch CEO Tony Sorensen said Bobby and Mark arrived at his office with a gun. He claims the pair showed him the weapon as an intimidation tactic in order to get what they wanted. After that alleged incident, Bobby had sealed his own fate with Von Dutch. After the gun incident, Sorensen claims that he gave Bobby a strict set of rules to abide by within the company and Bobby claims they agreed that he could work on a parallel clothing collection that was under the Von Dutch umbrella, but he'd be 100% owner. Shortly after that, 
Bobby claims he began receiving cease and desist letters from the Von Dutch factory, which he says came as a total surprise. As it turned out, Bobby had unknowingly signed his ownership over, and he was now only a licensee of the Von Dutch brand. Then, he was fired completely, which meant that he couldn't use any of the company's trademarked images or products to make money for himself, and there was nothing he could do about it. Bobby had signed the ownership documents without legal representation, thinking he didn't need it because he knew everybody involved. This, according to the Hulu docuseries, is when Bobby started to lose control of his life, and his actions were evidence of that. After his termination, Bobby and Mark began planning revenge against Mike Cassell, because he apparently didn't follow through on promises he'd made to Bobby. Essentially, Bobby believed that Cassell had hung him out to dry. The two friends arranged a meeting with Cassell, where Mark apparently beat Cassell up to intimidate him into doing what they wanted. The guys wanted a new contract that would bring them back into Von Dutch. Bobby claims he was upstairs during the altercation and didn't see what happened, but Cassell disputes that claim. Regardless of how it went down, the beating must have been brutal because Bobby said about Cassell in the Hulu docuseries, he's lucky to be alive. The next day, the three men agreed to meet again at a restaurant to sign a new contract. Bobby and Mark arrived at the meeting with a briefcase in tow. What the two friends didn't know at the time was there were more eyes on them than just the other restaurant patrons. Law enforcement had the restaurant surrounded. As Bobby took out the briefcase, cops swarmed the men, fearing there might be a weapon inside. Bobby believed that Cassell had notified law enforcement about their meeting as a safety precaution, but it was actually Cassell's then-wife who alerted police. She called in anonymously because she was afraid of what Bobby and Mark would do to her husband. After his brush with the law, Bobby finally decided to cut ties with Von Dutch and everyone involved in the company. His life was in shambles by this point. He even contemplated suicide. Bobby left Elijah in his grandparents' care while he tried to figure out his life. According to Bobby, Mark was also suffering deeply during this time. Both men had based their entire identities on their involvement with Von Dutch. Now, they'd lost everything and neither of them seemed to know how to cope. Bobby claims that Mark was having mental breakdowns and that he was obviously tortured over all he'd lost. Flat broke and unsure of what to do next, Bobby and Mark moved into an apartment together on Venice Boulevard. Their plan was to save money and start a new business venture together, but their closeness was quickly poisoned by increasing fights, and soon, Mark would be dead. According to the Los Angeles Police News Brief from that fateful night in 2005, the dispute led Vaughn to arming himself with a gun and shooting Revis several times until he died. Bobby Vaughn never disputed that he was the one who shot Mark Revis. He did, however, maintain that he had done so out of self-defense. While he was incarcerated and awaiting trial, Bobby called the lawyer he'd used in previous copyright disputes with Vaughn Dutch. That lawyer recommended Los Angeles defense attorney Dale K. Gileppo, who Bobby described as my cousin Vinny, Joe Pesci, except a huge dude. With his flamboyant style and fearlessness to go against the grain, Gileppo decided to make an unusual legal move. Murder charges usually take a year or two to go to trial, despite a defendant's rights to a speedy trial, because most of the time, defendants and their attorneys waive that right. Gileppo told Bobby they weren't going to do that. Instead, they pushed to go to trial within four months of Bobby being charged. Gileppo said that the major benefit of this was that the prosecution wouldn't have enough time to get ready for trial. Gileppo's lead investigator, who stayed anonymous on the Hulu docuseries, said their strategy was to emphasize self-defense and show why Bobby was so scared of Mark. The investigator said that people they spoke with about Bobby said that he was nice beneath his intimidating exterior. The investigator said in the docuseries, he's not really a gangster, he's a celebrity gangster. Gileppo pointed out that he usually sees the courtroom divided in a roughly equal crowd, victims people on one side and the defendants on the other. 
In this case, there was nobody on Bobby's side. Also uncommon for many trials was the fact that Bobby testified in his own defense. Bobby said that he was so nervous and fearful during his testimony that he would put breastfeeding pads under his arms to soak up all the sweat. When closing arguments concluded, Jaleppo told Bobby to expect at least a week or two before the jury would come back with a verdict. Much to their surprise, the jury had reached a verdict after only 30 minutes. The speedy decision worried Bobby and his lawyer because it typically meant bad news for the defendant. Despite his fears, the jury acquitted Bobby Vaughn on all three charges. As the Vaughn Dutch brand leaned more and more into its own hype in the mid-2000s, Sorensen got worried that it would become a faddish bubble that would soon burst, and he was right. Then, in 2004, two articles from the Orange County Press came out with allegations that Von Dutch himself had been a blatant neo-Nazi racist. The OC Press had obtained a letter that Von Dutch wrote on his deathbed. The letter was filled with explicit praise for the Third Reich, and it expressed Von Dutch's wish that he didn't want to live if he had to go on in a world filled with people of color and different religions, which he referred to by using racial and ethnic slurs. While the brand was at its height of popularity, Boswell said that Von Dutch had merely been a provocateur. He said Von Dutch was an avid military enthusiast, enamored of German military aesthetics, but he was not a white power guy. In a surprising twist, Boswell admitted to leaking the letter and Von Dutch's racial views to the media to tank the brand he believed had scorned him and pushed him out. And his tactic worked. By 2008, Sorensen sold his ownership to an unnamed bidder and washed his hands clean of the Von Dutch brand. Although 12 of his peers had ruled Bobby Von's actions a justifiable homicide, he wasn't completely out of trouble. After being acquitted on murder charges, Bobby pled guilty to owning an unregistered handgun. He served several years in Rikers prison for that. When he got out on probation around 2009, Bobby moved to Rockaway Beach, where he opened a surf shop dedicated to growing the notoriously difficult New York surf scene. Before Mark Revis's death, he and Bobby had started a fashion line called FTW after Bobby was fired from Von Dutch. Now, Bobby wanted to grow the business in his new location to encourage both high-end spending and a place for kids to learn how to surf instead of getting into gangs. Several articles go into Bobby's vision for the brand in 2009, including a New York Magazine profile, New York Times coverage, and Vaughn's own reply to the hype on Rockaway News website, The Wave. In all the coverage, Bobby expressed high hopes for the kids he wants to mentor as well as his company's exclusive surf gear. Since then, Bobby Vaughn has faded from the public eye. His clothing brand, FTW, seems to be sold exclusively on eBay, Poshmark, and other resale sites when it's not being used as a phrase for someone else's t-shirts or hoodies. Bobby has no public social media presence. The 2021 Hulu docuseries marked the first time he's garnered national attention again in over a decade. Meanwhile, Matthew Rivas has done his best to keep the memory of Mark alive. Matthew says that he holds no ill will towards Bobby, but that he believes justice was not served. Matthew summed up a simple wish by saying about his brother, I want people to know that people loved Mark. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Murderish. Don't forget to check out my new Patreon perks. Murderish Behind the Mic Patreon membership is a great option for those who've listened to every episode of Murderish and want access to bonus episodes or those who want to listen to the podcast with no ads. To sign up for Murderish Behind the Mic and get access to all of the exclusive perks, visit Murderish.com or just go to Patreon.com and search for Murderish there. I want to express a huge thank you to Annie G and Allison T for joining Murderish Behind the Mic. Thank you both so much. I'm looking forward to interacting with you guys on Patreon. For those who don't know, I host another true crime podcast. It's called Dirty Money Moves, Women in White Collar Crime. 
The podcast follows my investigation of a woman I met a few years ago, a woman who turned out to be a prolific scam artist. It's a wild story that even has ties to the Michael Jackson scandal. You can subscribe to Dirty Money Moves wherever you're listening right now. There are a bunch of episodes for you to binge right now. Do me the biggest favor and tell your friends about Murderish or leave the show a positive rating and review in any podcast app. You can also show your support by wearing a Murderish t-shirt while you're out and about. And trust me, it's a great conversation starter. Go to Murderish.com to buy t-shirts, bags, coffee mugs, and so much more. Follow Murderish on Instagram and TikTok at Murderish Podcast. I'm active on both platforms, so check it out. Murderish sound design and audio editing is by Justin Hellstrom. Some of the music was composed by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by Melanie Griffin. Visit Murderish.com for a list of sources used for this episode. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. <laughs> 